Thank you all very much for being here. Um, it was interesting, when I was sitting down to write this speech, um, I wrote it for darkness and coolness. And now I feel I have to change it, because what I've written is completely inappropriate for bright sunshine. It's going to drag you down into the depths, alas. Can everyone hear me? OK. This is called On Carrying and Being Carried. My hearty congratulations <coughs> to the shortlisted writers and translators for this year's Internationale Literatur Preis. And bigger congratulations yet to the eventual winner who we'll find out about very shortly. I was deeply moved to stand on this stage in the summer of 2013 to receive the award, not only because it honored my work, but because it manifested something else as well. No other accolade I had received up to that point, or that I have received since, has recognized to quite the same degree that the making of a book is not a solitary activity. The Internationale Literaturpreis honors a writer and a translator. I received it for my novel, Open City, and Christine Richter Nielsen simultaneously received it for her translation of Open City. Christine's Open City, she left the title untranslated, brought into German a work I wrote in English, but at times I think what she did was carry the book back into German. What I mean by this is that being translated can make visible certain realities in a given work. Far from the loss in translation that amateur theorists of poetry are always going on about, I find that there are substantial gains in translation. I refer not only to the extraordinary pleasure of having readers in languages I don't know. These are readers whose knowledge of my work is not a rough approximation, but who have rather been able to follow my every thought and turn of phrase for hundreds of pages. I think of the many people I've met who don't know English, but whose readerly intelligence concerning my work more than matches mine. But no, when I say something is gained in translation, I'm talking about something else. I mean that in translation, I somehow recognize some aspect of the wide reading that has formed my work. My text returns to some part of its scattered family like a prodigal child. Musing over the Italian translation of my work, I can feel Italo Calvino and Primo Levi, even though they are not authors any English journals ever mention in connection with me. In Turkish, it is Nazim Hikmet's political melancholy I think of. In German, perhaps even more than English, I sense the hovering presences of forebears, Walter Benjamin, Thomas Mann, Hermann Broch, and W.G. Sebald, among many others. So, in a sense, Christian Richter Nielsen's Open City returned my book to its right place on the shelf with its German ancestors. Sometimes my translators have a lot of questions for me. Sometimes they don't ask a lot. Often they become my friends. In each case, I trust them utterly. I entrust them with the task of taking my work to my true readers, some of whom might know almost no English. The same way I consider myself a true reader of Vishwava Szymborska, even though I know no Polish, or Svetlana Alexievich, even though I know no Russian. Hiromitsu Kyoso flew, flew from Tokyo to New York to personally explore the terrain of my book so that he could get a real feeling for my narrator's journey around New York. I remember the strange sensation of showing him the tangled streets of Chinatown. I indicated to him what I had written from life, and I pointed out to him where I had invented a street and a series of shops. 
Walking with him, my Japanese translator, I felt I was rewriting my book. Gioia Guerzoni, with whom I've been fortunate to do four books in Italian so far, seeks to bring my prose into a polished but idiomatic Italian. Recently, she was working on an essay of mine, On the Blackness of the Panther, which was a digressive and wide-ranging text on various matters, race, the color black, colonialism, panthers, the history of zoos, Rainer Maria Rilke, and so on. It wasn't an easy text to translate. And in particular, the question of blackness was complicated. Gioia considered nerezza or negritudine, both of which suggest negritude, but neither quite evoked the layered effect that blackness had in my original title, which was both about race, but also about the color black in an optical sense. She knew the word she was looking for couldn't be oscurita, which was simply about the color black itself, and maybe even negatively so, with its connotations of obscurity and darkness. So what she did was invent a word, nerita, la nerita de la pantera. It really worked. The word was taken up in reviews and even adopted by a dictionary. It was a word Italian needed, and it was a word Italian, the Italian of Dante and Morante and Ferrante, received through my translator. I had a conversation with Christine about her work on Open City. One of the things we discussed was the first sentence of the book, the epigraph. It reads, in my English, death is a perfection of the eye. Like Joya, Christine examines every phrase intensely to draw out its shades of meaning. They both understand that translation is literary analysis mixed with sympathy, a matter for the brain as well as the heart. The literal translation of death is a perfection of the eye, Christine tells me, would have been Tod is ein Perfektion des Auges. Perhaps a version one might get from Google Translate. But she sensed that this literal translation was missing out on the development or evolution implied by my original. That it was equating death with perfection of the eye, rather than understanding that death was being proposed as the root to a kind of visionary fullness. So she first thought of Vollendung, which describes a finished state of fullness. Then she thought further and landed on Verfallkommnung. Verfallkommnung is a noun that embeds the verb common, and with that verb the idea that something is changing and coming into a state of perfection. And that was the word she needed. The I is simple though, right? Das Auge. But Christine knew that what was being called the eye in my epigraph was not a physical organ, it was the faculty of vision itself. But I didn't write seeing, so Desayens would not quite have worked. In conversation with my editor, Carsten Kredel, she decided on something that evoked both the organ and its ability, der Blick. So her translation of death is a perfection of the eye after much careful thought was der Tod ist ein Vervollkommnung des Blickes. That was the first sentence, which left her with only a few thousand more to do. In the etymological root of the word translation in English is some of the promise of what I want to talk about here today. Translation comes from the Middle English, which originates from Anglo-French translater. That, in turn, descends from the Latin translatus. In translatus are those two units, trans, across or over, and latus, which is the past participle of ferre, 
to carry, which is related to our ferry. The translator then is the ferry operator, carrying meaning from words on that side of the shore to words on this side of the shore. German Übersetzung, translation, has the same sense of ferrying and retains it even more explicitly. Depending on pronunciation, a single word with the same spelling can mean either to translate or to traverse. Übersetzen or Übersetzen. Every work of translation carries a text into or back into the general literature of a language. Having had my work translated into 16 languages, I am now present in the literature of 16 languages, some of which are return journeys. Danny Laferriere expresses this slightly strange notion more beautifully than I can. Quote, when years later I myself become a writer and was asked, are you a Haitian writer, a Caribbean writer, or a Francophone writer? I would always answer that I took the nationality of my reader, which means that when a Japanese reader reads my books, I immediately became a Japanese writer, end quote. A young woman from Bonn named Pierre Klemp is currently facing a long drawn out legal battle in Italy. Klemp, a boat captain and former marine biologist, is accused of rescuing people in the Mediterranean in 2017. If the case comes to trial, as it seems likely to do, she and nine others in the NGO she works with face up to 20 years in prison or enormous fines. 15,000 euros for each person they rescued, of which there are thousands. Klemp is unrepentant. She knows that the law is not the highest calling. Endangered boats launched from Libya were rescued by a converted fishing boat that she captained, a boat named Juventa. The precious human cargo were ferried over to Lampedusa. There are many questions here, but there's really only one question. Do we believe that the people on those endangered boats on the Mediterranean are human in precisely the same way that we are human? When I visited Sicily a couple of years ago and watched a boat of rescued people, their faces bewildered, come to shore, there was only one possible answer to that question. And yet, we're surrounded by commentary that tempts us to answer wrongly. Or we are fooled to think our comfort and convenience is more important than human life. Pierre Klemp's holy labor, because it takes place on water, reminds me of an earlier struggle. In 1943, the grief that was visiting all of Europe became ever more intense. The Danes received word that Nazis wished to deport Danish Jews. And so, surreptitiously, at great personal risk, the fishermen of North Zealand began to ferry Danish Jews across to Sweden in small groups. This took place in October, when the water is cold. It went on day after day for three weeks, a very difficult work, until more than 7,000 people, the majority of the Jewish population in Denmark, had been taken to safety. Anything human in us recognizes this as a high ideal, as an exemplar of our humanity. And if it was true then, it remains true now. I am encouraged by the stance of the noted theorist of the Black Atlantic, Paul Gilroy, who, in receiving this year's Holberg Prize, said we should seek out, quote, what we can learn about the primal responsibility we bear towards others by observing humane, selfless, and generous responses to elemental perils like flood, drought, and pollution, as well as acute 
deadly emergencies, and risky activities like sea travel undertaken by fugitives and refugees." End quote. In my own country at the moment, in the name of national security, hundreds of people die on the border. They are left to die or some of them are killed by the government's agents. Children are separated from their parents and thrown in cages. A few years ago, I visited No Mas Muertes, No More Deaths, a humanitarian organization in Arizona that provides aid to travelers. They leave water, blankets, and canned food at strategic points in the Sonoran Desert, activities that the US government has declared illegal. They also conduct searches for missing migrants and often locate the bodies of those who have died of hunger or thirst in the desert. A young man named Scott Warren, a geographer, is one of those who refuses to simply stand by and watch. Walking with No Mas Muertes and other groups, he has sought to help travelers cross safely by providing water, by providing shelter. For this holy labor, Warren was arrested and charged last year with harboring and sheltering migrants. The criminal complaint said he was providing food and water and a bed and clean clothes to two men. Even though the case against him has just ended in mistrial, Warren is far from being the only No Mas Muertes volunteer arrested as part of the American government's war on those who render help towards our fellow citizens. But can a link truly be drawn between the intricate and often modest labor of writers and translators and the bold and physically costly behavior of people like Pia Klemp and Scott Warren? Is the work of literature connected in any way to the risks certain citizens undertake to save others? I think so because acts of language can very often be a prelude to acts of courage. And even more pointedly, because acts of language themselves can be acts of courage. Writing, the kind that matters to me, is neither entertainment nor propaganda. I think of lines written by Edwige Dantica in her book, Create Dangerously. Quote, Somewhere, if not now, then maybe years in the future, a future we have yet to dream of, someone may risk his or her life to read us. Somewhere, if not now, then maybe years in the future, we may also save someone's life. I think now of a dear friend of mine, a Turkish professor, who signed a letter in 2016. This letter condemning the ongoing slaughter of Kurds by the Turkish state, and it was endorsed by more than 1,100 Turkish signatories. The letter had great moral clarity, but it was carefully worded. Here's how it opens. The Turkish state has effectively condemned its citizens in Sur, Silvan, Nusaybin, Sizre, Silopi, and many other towns and neighborhoods in the Kurdish provinces to hunger through its use of curfews that have been ongoing for weeks. It has attacked these settlements with heavy weapons and equipment that would only be mobilized in wartime. As a result, the right to life, liberty, and security, and in particular, the prohibition of torture and ill treatment protected by the constitutional constitution and international conventions have been violated. The letter continues in this vein, and it calls for peace, for a cessation of violence by the Turkish government, particularly against Turkish people. In response, the government of Recep Tayyip Erdogan launched investigations on each of the signatories accusing them of terrorism. Most of them, my friend included, now face long trials and prison sentences. Many have been fired from their jobs or hounded by students. Some have already been jailed. 
The foreign academics, including Noam Chomsky and Slavoj Zizek, who later signed the letter, also came in for harsh criticism and legal threats from Erdogan. You could say that my friend and the more than 1,000 other Turkish academics she stood with were involved in carrying their fellow citizens, the Kurds. At the stroke of a pen, they attempted to carry them across the desert of indifference, across the waters of persecution. For this, they face consequences similar to those faced by Pierre Klemp and Scott Warren, public disrepute, impoverishment, prison time. My friend finds herself in extreme danger for carrying others across. And so now it is her turn to be carried, to be ferried to some greater safety because she did the right thing. And we must too. I am struck by a small terracotta sculpture made in Etruria in the fourth century BCE. It depicts two men, one carrying the other on his back, a younger man carrying an older man. It is, in fact, a sculptural illustration of Aeneas carrying his father Anchises out of the burning ruins of Troy. The story is recounted by Virgil in the Aeneid and is part of the myth of the founding of the Roman people. This little sculpture has tremendous effective charge because almost none of us can imagine having to physically carry our own father. Support him, yes, perhaps in old age. Actually carry him on your back, no. Impossible to imagine except in the most wretched emergency. The little Etruscan sculpture is strikingly similar to a famous vignette from the fresco in the Vatican showing the fire in the Borgo. That fresco, painted in the early 16th century by Raphael, or more likely Giulio Romano, shows a young man bearing an old man on his back. Why the similarity? Because there are only so many ways to carry a frail old man on your back. And a few years ago, while I was musing on the similari similarity between the Etruscan sculpture and the Giulio Romano fresco, I came across a photojournalist's image of a pair of refugees. I can't find the photographer's name, but one of the men in the picture is identified as Dakhil Nasso. The man he is carrying is his father. They are Yazidi in flight on foot from ISIS on the way to Kurdistan. They've been on the move for days, and all you can see behind them is desert. It is a piteous sight. The old man, dressed in white, is on the verge of exhaustion, and the young man in a, young, in a red football jersey is hardly stronger. How far have they come already? How much farther do they have to travel? Why have we allowed this to happen to our fellow citizens? I call these people fellow citizens following a usage by Ariella Azule because I truly believe that is what they are. Citizenship has nothing to do with what papers one has or doesn't have. We all live and die under the same sovereign arrangements. We are all subject to the same international banking system, the same alliances among rich nations. We are all citizens of these inescapable powers. But not all citizens have their citizenship rights recognized. Great claims are frequently made for literature on stages such as this one. For example, that people who read literature are wiser or kinder, that literature inspires empathy. But is that true? 
I find that literature doesn't really do those things. There's no true correlation in the scientific sense between literary practice and the way we treat others so long as we define them as others. The recent death of the great Swedish author Sven Lindqvist, who wrote so piercingly about colonialism and violence, has had me reading about aerial bombing again. And I wonder if there isn't in fact a greater likelihood that those cultures that pride themselves on their literary achievements are also the ones that bomb others. It seems sometimes that we have libraries here so that we may shower death upon them over there. Having observed the foreign policies of the so-called developed countries, I cannot trust any complacent claims about the power of literature to inspire empathy. What we can go to literature for is both larger and smaller than cliches of how it makes us more empathetic. Literature cannot stop the persecution of humans or the prosecution of humanitarians. It cannot stop the bombing of black people or brown people. It cannot, no matter how finely express, expressed, change the minds of the little fascists that are once more overrunning this continent. So then, what is it good for? All this effort, this labor, this sweating over the right word to write, the correct word to use in translation. Let me gently offer this. Literature can save a life, just one life at a time, and that life is yours. And maybe it saves you only in certain moments, perhaps at 4 a.m. when you get out of bed and pull a book of poetry from the shelf, perhaps over the course of a week in summer when you're absorbed in a great novel. Literature is not a precision weapon. You cannot test it in a lab to create positive effects. And yet, I know that all the reading and writing I've done and my being translated and my being read have made their contribution to my ability to think about life and to side with what is good in life. Literature, because it is slow and inefficient, has helped me to think about people like Scott Warren and Pierre Klemp and my Turkish friend, and has somewhat, somehow helped me agree with their fundamental courage. I speak only for myself. Literature, whether it directly addresses political issues or whether it is more oblique in its methods, is of only two kinds, good literature and bad literature. The goodness is some combination of moral content and technical accomplishment. I say it again, good literature has saved at least one life, mine, and not once and for all, but only at certain moments. But I also know I am not alone in the world. In a speech he gave in Uppsala in 1957, Albert Camus described the collective impact of our seemingly disconnected lives. Quote, Some will say that this hope lies in a nation, others in a man. I believe, rather, that it is awakened, revived, nourished by millions of solitary individuals whose deeds and works every day negate frontiers and the crudest implications of history. A codex of the Mishnah written in Parma in the mid 13th century declares, whoever destroys a single life is considered by scripture to have destroyed the whole world. And whoever saves a single life is considered by scripture to have saved the whole world. Exactly the same thought is expressed in Surah 5 of the Quran. My friend, the translator Anayega, reminds me that there's a word 
that used to be a good word, a praiseworthy word in this country back when the country was divided. Flüchtlingshelfer, flight helper, one who helps those who are in flight, refugee aid. When did that become a bad word? Why is the Flüchtlingshelfer punished in almost every country now? Is it because those being helped are the wrong color, the wrong religion, because their presence reminds us of what we don't want to be reminded of? In some modest but essential way, contrary to the general noise of the culture around us, writing has reminded me of things that people don't want to be reminded of. That's a small thing. A small, small thing. Almost not worth mentioning. But inside this small thing called literature, I have found reminders to negate frontiers and carry others across, and reminders of others that carry me too. That's quite a scary thing. Imagine being in such an emergency, a house on fire, a sinking boat, a court case, an endless trek, a changing planet, an emergency that means you can no longer think only of your own movement, but that you have to carry someone else or have to be carried by someone else. Thank you.